Um, so today, as Preggy said, I'll be talking about some pre-processing state-of-the-art challenges, pitfalls, should add some woes as well. Um, so I'm going to give a kind of a big overview of all some of these methods. Um, I guess I can't go into each method in detail, I'll go into maybe a couple of them in detail. Um, but I want to give you people who don't do pre-processing a kind of a, a general picture of what to do, what the current um, ideas in, out there in literature are. So, I mean, the pre-processing kind of um, approach here that I'm talking about is specifically to do with um, recent fMRI, RS fMRI, kind of the hard problem because there's no um, ground truth. For those that don't know, a little primer. So resting state um, fMRI uses fMRI, which measures its indirect measure of um, cortical activity. Um, so what, what was discovered, you know, many, many years ago was that um, at rest, you put a subject into a scanner, so they're resting, not doing any task. And if you look at their co-activations, you can see here um, a plot or a figure of these correlations. If you put a, a seed in the PCC, in the posterior single cortex in there, what you find is that you have these, um, these correlated networks uh, which happen just at rest without any task. You also find kind of these anti-correlated networks as well. Um, another way to look at this as well is to take your cortex and split up in little chunks called parcellation, that's what it's called there, and you can split up in terms of different kind of regions like the visual area, the somatic sensor area, that kind of stuff. And you can generate these correlation maps for each of these regions and end up in a big, uh, what they call a functional connectivity matrix. So I guess a take home from this is that the brain has structure. Um, the problem is very easy because, as I said, it's someone resting in a scanner, not sleeping, resting. Um, so it has a lot of um, clinical widespread use. Um, it's why it's been used quite a lot. It's quite easy um, to acquire. Uh, it's been used to determine difference in cohorts. People have seen changes in these functional connectivity between cohorts, between bipolar disorder, controls, schizophrenia, that kind of um, approach. However, it's very hard to interpret and it's very hard to analyze. There are many, many compounds. So here I see the problem with rest. So here I have um, data that has been, I guess, lightly denoised, lightly pre-processed. And you can see here I, I do the same analysis of this PCC seed. And what you can see is a fairly widespread activity. Almost the whole brain um, has you know, these non-zero non um, positive correlations. And if you look at the FC matrix on the right-hand side, you see the entire brain is, is red. The entire brain is correlated. So under these typical minimal pre-processing pipelines, so things like you do like you know, standard SPM pre-processing, standard stuff in FSL, you have very large global correlations. Everything's correlated. Um, another big problem about this as well, because of this, if you look at the actual correlation values, um, the magnitudes you get from there are correlated to things such as mean head motion, uh, mean breathing rates, um, and sometimes some hardware effects. And they're not really capturing neurological effects that you think that you're capturing. Um, and the problem with this as well is there's no ground truth in Western State fMRI. Um, so you have to, it's, it's very hard to validate some of these methods, uh, which is why there's a lot of uh, research uh, into denoising resting State fMRI. <coughs> That brings forward to my overview then. So what I'll go through is um, some definition of terms um, between pre-processing and denoising. They're both under the umbrella of pre-processing, but I'm going to split them up here. I'll talk about kind of this minimal pre-processing kind of steps, um, the dilemma of decisions, and using fMRI prep to um, hopefully reduce this dilemma, uh, and show you some of the artifacts you get in this uh, minimal pre-processing and I'll go into denoising, and if I have time, uh, look at some high resolution um, fMRI data as well. So as I said before, any pre-processing before you do any analysis is essentially pre-processing, um, but I'm just I'm splitting this up into two parts. So the minimal pre-processing pre step, otherwise called an MPP, are general steps that everyone kind of agrees on, and there are clearly defined physical models on how to um, process your data. Um, so for example, I would say in the human, pro in the human connectome project, I've used a terminology, they call the minimal pre-processing pipeline. So if you download some HCP data and look at the task data, it's in this MPP pipeline. 
Um, so the next step after doing that is an additional step called denoising. Is where you take the time series and you try to remove noise from MPP that's not easily modeled by uh, clear defined physical effects. So I'm going to show you some of these minimal processing. So first off, typical thing people uh, you think of this sort of stuff is to do something called minimal, um, sorry, motion correction, which otherwise known as registration. As you can see here in this EPI slice, you can see the um, someone moving and the traces showing three um, uh, movement parameters. Uh, they're revolving at a time as the subject moves. This is one of the steps that's done very early on. Another thing under this umbrella of minimal preprocessing is uh, distortion correction. As you can see here, I can see here, part of the brain is sort of missing here. And over here, the brain is distorted there. And that's due to the inhomogeneities um, of, um, of the magnetic field that cause these distortion effects. And there are clearly defined physical models to correct for this, um, which is why I'm still in this umbrella of minimal preprocessing. Um, the next step people will do, which is slightly controversial, uh, is to do slice time correction. So what you do, uh, most scans are acquired um, in the rest in this fMRI, acquired slice by slice. And so this method tries to account for this slice by slice variability and tries to correct for this is timing. That's what's called slice time correction. Uh, the next thing people do as well is also the functional to anatomical registration, co-registration, or the alignment should say there, there as well. You can see here I take the functional MRI and I try to align it to a, uh, an anatomical image. And last thing under this kind of umbrella as well is something called um, kind of normalization. So what you want to do is compare subjects under a standard template. Uh, you can do so by doing kind of this um, warping of a subject from uh, the original space onto a um, target template. So here we have the MNI 152 template in the, in the volume stream. Another thing which um, is done quite a lot as well is this surface normalization, which is done um, in the HCP. Um, people are um, going more and more towards using this um, surface normalization. So although I, I said there are you know, fairly defined physical models on how to do these things and are generally, um, I guess, agreed upon, um, there is a, quite a, a bit of um, dilemma, I would say, is that when you're trying to put which steps you do first. Um, also, every, every algorithm um, that it comes from, each of these processes, come from different toolbox. So for example, like AFNI, ISPM, ANTS, FreeSurfer, FSL, they're all very good at one thing, but they're not at everything. Um, so it gets the, you get, if you look at any of these pre-processing pipelines, they're quite complicated. You have a whole bunch of software dependencies you need. Um, and also the versions actually are, are quite important too, because sometimes the versions have bugs and they get propagated through. Um, so to meet this kind of these big problems, fMRI prep was invented by, I guess, the Poldrack group. Um, so that's the paper on there, if you if you've seen this before. Um, so it tries to address some of these problems because it's a uh, open source and it's community based. Um, it works with um, the brain imaging data structure, BIDS. So as long as you have your data in the right format, you can just apply this straight away. Um, another thing which is also quite important, I guess Johan, I thought about before, these virtual environments. Um, it's made in this um, Docker slash singularity kind of local environment, uh, which has all these versions um, in place in one, one container. So for instance, I can run version, you know, FMI prep version 1.01, .01, and it will have certain versions of all FSL, AFNI, SPM, all that kind of stuff. So you can have quite tight control to say, um, using this version of FMI prep, I have all the following um, versions under control. So we've got switched to this quite a lot in our lab um, because of this, of these, these issues. Um, it's creating some of these issues. So, this is a big overflow of the minimal processing steps I, I thought about before. Um, so you take your imaging data in bits format. Um, we take it pretty much direct from the scanner, convert to bits, send the fMRI prep, and it has all these steps um, that go from the top to the, to the bottom there. So you can see that you had this anatomical preprocessing pipeline and then this functional preprocessing pipeline. And it's all done automatically in fMRI prep. And you can switch things on, switch things off, um, which is really quite, quite amazing. So I just want to show you an example of this. You might have seen this if you've read, if you're thinking about preprocessing, I would say this is the way to go. You might have seen this, but I want to go through an example of what it gives you in the end. So this is a line of code that, you know, once I've installed it from my prep, this is exactly a code that I've run on some of our data. 
So exactly, just you invoke the call fMRI prep um, and you essentially um, have the label of the subject. You say what output space you want, so you can, you can uh, get your data re-registered on the template on surface average data or on, um, volume um, normalized data, I should say. You can use um, denoising techniques uh, and you can use various distortion correction techniques. So I want to show an example of once you put all this together, what are the things you get? So to be interactive, this is the only interactive thing I have. Um, so for example, I ran fMRI prep on this subject. This is from the UCLA um, uh, Phenomics Connectome um, project, uh, which is available on Open Neuro. Um, so you can see here gives you a, a, a summary of what's happened. Uh, here are the parameters I've used. And this is, a, this is actually quite nice. That's another point is that um, you can't really trust these automatic pipelines. You need to really visually inspect each and every subject. And so FMI Prep does this in a way of a very nice reporting system. So you can go for each subject, look at each of the steps to see if anything's gone wrong. We've often seen things go wrong and have to rerun FMI Prep with, with various flags. So here's an example of the brain mass and tissue segmentation. As you can see, it's quite nice. Um, here's an example of the volume normalization. So if you hover over there, you can see the, that's the normal, that's the template. You see it's switching back and forth, how nice it looks. And other things such as the surface reconstruction made from FreeSurfa. As we go on, there's other stuff to look at the, um, for example, the distortion correction. As you can see here, we have this warping that we do. Um, that's because of the inhomogeneity. And you can see here, you kind of have this restretching of the um, API sequence. We, we can really diagnose each subject to see whether or not this is a problem or not. It's a, it's a very, very useful tool fMRI prep has. And things such as ROIs in, um, in bolt space, and another example here of the co-registration step of how good it looks. Um, I'll remind you, well, this data, I'll just tell you, well, this data is three by three by four, so fairly low resolution, and it seems to do quite a good job, and it's quite easy to um, go through each of these steps and, and, and des decide whether or not it's a good subject. And other things such as looking at um, time series, and so on, and also denoising strategies, which I'll get to a little bit later. Cool, so get back to this here. So it's quite a, a good little system there. Um, now I think to break up time, what I'll do now is I'll take any questions um, of fMRI prep, if you have them now. That's a good question. Um, the reason is that um, a lot of the steps in SPM, for instance, aren't optimized. Um, so we can talk about it, and it's a bit more of a discussion, but um, there are points that um, just don't work that, that well. Okay. Um, so for example, the co-registration isn't, isn't that great. The normalization is actually not very good. I mean, Dartel is a lot better for um, normalization of the, of the volumes, um, but it's inferior to, to ANTS. So maybe just Okay. As something like this is uh, agnostic to, as you say, one particular um, software pipeline. Mm -hmm. Okay. And also another thing is that, um, I mean, in SPR, I've done a lot of the preprocessing. It's very hard to diagnose each of these steps. You can look at them. Yeah, it looks good. I mean, you know, but if you have like, if you run an SPM batch file, you run, you know, a thousand subjects. Like what we're kind of getting towards is big, um, big data. Um, and essentially, that's, that's quite, quite hard to diagnose each subject to be with SPM tools. I found that anyway. And this at least has some reporting that everyone can, can look at and say, all right, this is all going right. Another thing is that the versions of MATLAB is also um, can depend on various things, your version of SPM as well. Um, this keeps all that on a tight control. <laughs> 
Oh, sorry, I didn't answer that. Um, I didn't describe that. So this is all written in Python using things such as um, all that NiPipe. It's all within that, that framework. So it's open source, it's free. That's, that's one also thing that's also benefiting um, using um, fMRI prep as opposed to SVM. Yep. It's all handled within the container. So if you rerun it through the same container with the same seeding, it's going to be secure or completely reproducible. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you ran it on a different version of MATLAB or a different um, OS, it will be completely different results each time. Well, I don't think it would be completely different. I mean, I, I would hope that my results that I'm going to report about the nature of the universe uh, don't depend on the seeding of MATLAB at the time that I ran it. I take the point that you want complete and utter replication if you need it so that you can show from data to figure that you can do that um, seamlessly. Um, but there's a point at which what we are ultimately trying to report should be um, invariant to particular sequences of or robust to particular details of the implementation. But that's, that's a completely different orthogonal discussion I think. I mean, I don't think it's completely orthogonal because uh, essentially, a lot of people don't report what they do. <laughs> so it's a lot of like, oh, which version? There's no mention of which version, which computer you're doing. So, an fMRI, rest into fMRI is very, very noisy. So we're not at the stage that it's, a lot of things are reproducible in fMRI, rest into fMRI. Um, that's a different point, but I'll, I'll go on from, from there. <laughs> but because of the, you were saying, because of the contentious issues in the literature, we definitely need to tighten up our control over our specific sequence of um, steps when we implement. So we can nail down ex processing. exactly. So we can nail down the problems and things of improvement. Okay. I think. Yeah. Thank you. Brecky uh, was my PC advisor. <coughs> anybody who? Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Cool. Okay. So I'll go to the next step here. Um, so once we've done this minimal process, pre-processing pipeline um, using fMRI prep or any other tool you use, um, we have to kind of look at the data and see how see see what, what's left in the data. Now there are some tools here I'm going to talk about. Um, so I'm going to go through essentially um, things such as ways to look at your your data uh, and types of denoising and the, some of the terminology as well. As you can see, there are a lot of things I'm going to describe. So it's going to be a very big overview. Uh, and we'll have a question at the end of this as well, um, if you're interested in any of these. So one way to look at your resident state fMRI data is to do things called carpet plots. So these plots, uh, or gray plots, I don't like the word gray plots, but these plots uh, essentially have a, um, an image, a heat map, where the x-axis is time and the y-axis are voxels. So if you kind of do this on any kind of minimal pre-processing pipeline, this is prefix ICN HCP data, what you find is that you have these large um, global shifts of activity. Um, and you might ask, okay, maybe this, is, maybe this is neuronal. I mean, there's an argument to say, which I'll talk about later, that these large shifts are neuronal. But then if you look at things such as movement, respiratory, physiology, what you find is a lot of these, um, these big blips are tightly correlated, tightly time-locked um, to these, these, these um, effects of motion and um, respiratory. And these drive up correlations ridiculously high. So you can imagine, for instance, in every, every part, every, every voxel is uh, the same kind of deflection. That means your, if you look at your correlation between voxels, it's gonna drive it up very, very high. So this is the source of the global correlation that you see. Um, and this has become a very powerful tool um, that's been used quite a lot by Jonathan Power, kind of really, um, he didn't invent it, but I guess he really uh, uh, popularized it um, in many years and many um, kind of analyses. So on that point, by doing these carpet plots and look at them and they're quite carefully, you see some, a um, lot of sources of, of noise, um, or should say non-neuronal um, signatures. So one thing you see here is you end in this um, left-hand plot there, you see in physiology, you essentially have 
um, kind of these traces in your physiology and they're related to these big global artifacts, um, global signals you see in, in your data. On the right hand side, you also see some hardware malfunctions which can also give rise to these big large shifts. And these are done all with this sort of minimal pre-processing kind of pipeline. Um, so what you find out with these that you, you need to do some further pre-processing, which, which I describe as denoising. This is the way to really have a look at, at these um, type of um, effects. So how do you get rid of noise in your recent fMRI data? So what the general plan, which is done um, for most of these noisy program uh, uh, strategies, is to essentially um, try to estimate um, your noise um, from some kind of variable, such as a motion regressor, a physiological regressor, um, or some kind of hardware trace, possibly. And what you do then is then you fit, essentially, um, you, you're using a GLM, fit the expression of this noise in your data set Y. So an example here, uh, the noise data would be the original data Y minus the expression, I guess the GLM fit, um, the model fit, um, data minus this model fit gives you a denoise signal. And this is common in, in most of these, uh, these denoising strategies. Another thing people do as well is that um, you can sometimes, uh, or you, you can have two different flavors of this um, typical regression. So what you don't normally do, um, I guess in this non-aggressive framing people call this, is that you estimate, have some estimate of the noise, whether it be um, some kind of uh, motion, that kind of stuff, and you have some estimate of signal. So for example, if you do some network discovery, some uh, task, you use that into your, uh, into your design matrix X, then what you do is you fit your model and then you just regress out the noise component. So you're fitting everything and you're regressing out just noise. Now this non-aggressive regression, um, uh, which comes in many different um, these packages, uh, these processes, um, if you have any shared variance between your noise and your signal, for example, is your noise also containing some of the signal, you kind of retain this variance in the signal and you're non-aggressively taking out noise. In the aggressive regime, you're only fitting noise and you're taking that all out. Um, so if you have any shared variance between noise and signal, uh, unfortunately that this will be quite aggressive to that and will just remove out from, from your data. So this is the terminology when you see aggressive and non-aggressive in literature. So here are examples of models of noise. I'm going to talk about the next, um, this one here. So something you can do is you can expect that noise will happen in kind of non-brange or non-interesting regions. So for example, we can take um, you know, the white matter, which we shouldn't expect much bold fluctuations, uh, non-brained tissue. And you can take these compartments, look at the mean signal amplitude as your model of uh, noise, and you can use that to regress out from your data. As you can see here, this is in the green and the yellow, this is um, white matter, and this is here is uh, CSF, and this is gray matter here. And as, as you can see, a lot of these um, kind of deflections are present in all of these uh, compartments, so you expect that if you do this regression, therefore you have a handle on some of the noise. Uh, this is the, the denoising strategy. And that's kind of the umbrella term you see in kind of white matter CSF regression, something called comp core, which is a little bit more fancy, um, treatment of, of these compartments uh, and uh, representation of the signals and, and that's I call by the AFNI group which is um, a non-local -loc version of this, oh, sorry it's a local version of this regression. Uh, so another point I'll add as well is that uh, essentially fMRI prep um, has all this calculation for you except for an core. it does all this for you automatically so at the end you can choose to apply this using this regression type of model. So they're the kind of like very, very broad strategies um, to do this re the compartment regression. The next step, next kind of category of these noise techniques is using spatial ICA. Um, so what does, IC what, does, what does this involve? So you take, you take your data, some bold data, you apply some um, spatial ICA using Melodic or GIFT, some of these um, toolboxes or fast ICA, whatever you like. Um, you then have your um, spatially independent components which are estimated from ICA. And then you kind, of, you kind of classify your components. You look at each of them to see which one of these belong to kind of a noise category or a signal category. Uh, and you, you, do, you do two strategies. You look at the time series to see it's very, very noisy. For example, high frequency noise uh, 
Um, is high frequency signals are more correlated to something which is more noisy, like hardware related or, or pulsations. A signal would have a slightly lower frequency, which is more in line with the baud response, the time scale of the baud response, uh, and would, would have something that looks more like a resonance state network. And so you use this uh, classification, and then you apply it to your data, and you denoise your data using the steps I showed before. And there are a few different strategies you can use um, which imply this general overarching framework. First one is called uh, FIX, which is made by um, people at FSL um, uh, group. What they generally do is they get, get a bunch of these ICA components, probably hard to see here, and they do just that. They apply the um, spatial ICA with the spatial maps, look at the time course, and manually label what is noise and what is signal. And they use all of this information in a big training set um, and they kind of learn what noise is. And by doing that, you can apply it to new data and you can then automatically denoise um, your, uh, your signals, your bold data. Just applying this type of stuff before. And this is done either aggressively, so fitting all the noise and removing it, or non-aggressively where you retain signal and then remove noise only. The next step is uh, something called aroma. It's an aroma that um, uh, Homer Simpson is smelling. Um, so ICA aroma, what does it do? Okay, so it takes um, your ICA and it applies a very um, very stringent um, classification. It's, it's, it's very robust because it, it features on very um, repeatable things that are most likely due to motion. So this is the automatic removal of motion artifacts. So it looks at um, max, maximum is correlations, the edge functions, uh, the CSF fraction, and high frequency content. Here's an example here <coughs> where I have, um, this is an apple from, um, actually from fMRI prep. You have in the, on the red, you have this noise component. You can see it's not very structured. It doesn't look like any sort of um, any neurological signal. And you have in the green, um, you also have this, um, uh, this something that looks more like a bold activity sort of localize in the visual cortex, they have a very kind of slow oscillations. So they show that by doing this and using, um, you know, aroma compared to other motion regression techniques, so for example, you can take all your motion traces and use that as a model for noise. It seems that aroma seems to be quite, um, quite, quite great at removing some of these noise th um, techniques. Another technique on this spatial ICA, something called multi-echo ICA, and so this requires something a little bit different. You, know, you need a dedicated scan. You need a scan to have multiple echoes. So here, here example, in A and B of a 3T and a 7T example, you have these three echoes. So you, essentially, when you apply an RF pulse and you have, RF pulse and you have an acquisition phase, you require the image at different um, echo times. As you can see here, you have the echo time. This short echo time, it's like the normal echo time you do it at 7T, it's like longer echo time. And you can combine them up to form your final image. So you use all this information um, because you use all information to determine noise and signal. And the way it's done is the idea is that um, things that are TE dependent, we know that bold is uh, echo time dependent, are most likely to be signal. Things that are TE independent, things that are uh, hard related, are most likely going to be noise. And that's the algorithm, that's the um, kind of the learning it does, or the model it applies. So you can see here, these two different um, terms, that's the bold term, that's the artifact term. And you can see here, if you look at each of these ICA components, it automatically detects which one is bold, which one is artifact. And so here's an example of, of what it gets. As you can see here, this is the, um, this is the raw signal you see um, just in a, in a scan with lots of artifact. On this here is the low kappa non-bold. You can see this movement activity is now captured in this low kappa um, ICA component. And the high, ca high kappa, which is a bold component, you can see it's, it's not really, um, it doesn't have any of this um, motion artifact, this striping. And that's because you have you acquire multiple echoes. You acquire, uh, you know, th you know, in this case, three readouts, and you use that to um, kind of combine things together and you have a, a benefit um, in your data. So in an example of, of something we've applied in our data, we now acquire pretty much a lot of, all fMRI is all done uh, multi-echo. We also do multi-echo, multi-band, or simultaneous multi-slice. And you can see here, this is an example of lots of noise, but here in the TSNR plots, the temporal signal to noise, you have this really big black spot. 
which kind of disappears once you uh, apply this um, denoising technique, which is really quite nice. It's another case as well where we have, well, it's hard to see here, but we have a ringing in one of our um, uh, low TE um, images, and once you do this um, optimal combination and this denoising, you have a much cleaner image. So the example here is um, we use uh, ICA fix and we compare that to the quality of multi echo ICA. So ICA fix is designed on a um, 500 cohort subject uh, um, study. We had um, probably like maybe 10, 20% of the data trained. So we had to mainly essentially determine what a noise or signal and then we apply that training to denoise our data. And this multi, this multi band um, and multi echo uh, acquisition with four echoes. Uh, what we found that with you know just in one single subject, we have a fairly considerable uh, improvement in, in temporal signal to noise. Um, and this doesn't require this big, large training set. So it's very um, attractive um, for these studies. Cool. Now, so the next step is um, something else, something a little bit different. Um, it's instead of looking at uh, spatially independent components, the new sort of direction. Uh, that's going on now is look at the temporal independent component. This is very, very hard to do because you need a lot of data to do this. Uh, and so I guess essentially the only study that has done this in fMRI uh, with great, um, I guess, success is um, the people from HCP, which have a lot of time points. They have something like 4,800 4, time points when you put all the runs together. And they use uh, temporal ICA, which is the same kind of principles in, of space, but in time instead. Um, to derive uh, temporally independent time courses. As I said, also it's very uh, as data hungry. And this is applied uh, post, um, I guess, things like, such as ICA or spatial ICA fix. And so this seems to be quite, quite amazing actually. It's quite an incredible paper. If, if, you have, if you're interested in denoising in HCP, it's a long read. It's a very hard slog, but it is a quite an incredible piece of work. Um, so here, you do the same kind of thing. You also have this manual component um, going for each of these time points. And you essentially have this training and you can determine um, you know, which, much, much, much better detail um, some of these um, uh, noisy components. This is all based essentially looking at the time series to see whether it correlates to um, essentially something that's neuronal and a special location of where it is. Um, also another thing I'll, I'll add as well, um, with temporal ICA, because you have uh, enforced the uh, independence of time, um, it means that each of the regressors are independent, which means that aggressive versus non-aggressive isn't really an issue. So you can see here, um, I think people really call it state of art of um, pre-processing. People really kind of bang on that idea. Um, one thing you can see here, so this, this is, um, I guess, data that's already been fixed, so as fixed pre-processing. Once you apply this um, temporal ICA, you kind of get rid of all of these big bands of activity uh, which have been classified um, due to some kind of noisy structure. And you can see a lot of these kind of really um, disappear in this um, temporal ICA component. So another thing that's quite impressive too, or a big advancement in the field I would say, is to not just use um, resting state fMRI and look at which one has better stats, is to apply this in where you have a little bit more ground truth. So in this particular paper, they applied this temporal ICA strategy to task and looked to see whether or not um, task was affected or any task-related variance was removed. I'll go on that a little bit later. So the last uh, one I want to go through um, is this thing called global signal regression. Um, if you're in the field and doing with fMRI, you either love it or really, really hate it. So you either wincing or smiling, I'm not sure. Um, so as I said before, RSMRI is really drew, it really has a lot of um, artifacts um, and uh, it, has, it induces, um, I guess, uh, a lot of these uh, big global correlations. Um, so what's been found, this is a pretty big paper by Jonathan Power and PNAS. He found using a pretty uh, proper denoise technique, such as multi-echo ICA, like I showed before, is pretty good. Um, following the denoising of multi echo ICA, you still see these large bands of, of activity. You can see in this carpet plot here. And this is, this is a motion trace. You can see these big, large bands of activity, which drive these large positive correlations. 
Um, and in his paper, he went in quite got a big detail to say that um, most of these preprocessing pipelines still have this. Um, they could be related to physiology, which can't get you can't get rid of. Um, and the other thing, the other way you can get rid of all these is using um, this thing called global signal regression. So what you do is you average all your time series into a mean, and you have a mean time series. You then use this in your regression. You regress everything from this mean, and you're left with signal which doesn't have a mean, and also uh, is void of some of these artifacts here. Uh, Kevin, you, you average all the gray matter boxes at one time point? Each time point, yeah, yeah. And that's your global signal? Yeah. So you do Every single bold volume will have a mean of zero. Exactly, exactly right. Okay. <laughs> this is the, the probably the non-GSR camp here. Um, <laughs> so you can... <laughs> you can either uh, do this by looking at the mean uh, gray matter signal or the mean total signal, and they're very highly correlated. So we see something that's globally correlated, and then we fix it by just regressing it out. Yeah, exactly right. Magic, isn't it? This is magic. <laughs> so it's a, ver a very visually striking result of GSR that you kind of don't see these things tied to these patterns. Um, no matter what side you're on, this is very hard to ignore, I think. And so. The problem with GSR is that um, essentially a GSR has some neural correlates. So if you do kind of invasive, uh, I guess, uh, studies, you find the global signal has a, a real definite neural correlate. Um, that, you know, sometimes, you know, in this particular study had this V4 electrode, uh, and you look at its um, LFP sort of trace, and that's correlated to the mean, um, mean signal. Um, another problem with GSI is that by doing this by construction mathematically, you drive all your correlations to zero um, and you have, you induce artificial negative correlations or they're probably there. Um, cool. And so also that GSI has a um, very strong dependence on correlation to motion um, and also GSI does not discriminate. It does not essentially, um, does, not, does not do any sort of QC, you just do it. <coughs> So, um, there's really no consensus to do it or not. I mean, people have written either camp. There was a consensus paper in 2017, and the consensus of that uh, paper was that there's no consensus. <laughs> um, they're very hard to ignore these visual QC properties, so I would like to stress it again. And so, I guess all strategies really report that the method is best. My method outperforms that method, therefore, we have the best method. Um, the choice that you do, all these methods, are, I guess, the by a number of factors. Uh, things such as people like to look at these things as a reduction of these widespread deflections on copper plots. Um, also the spatial temporal resolution. If you have very low spatial resolution, what you have, most people have in the world um, compared to HCP, you can't really apply ICA fix that well and uh, temporal ICA is very, very hard or impossible to do. Um, and people also have this other metric is what gives you the best stat, stat statistics. Um, so I'm going to show you kind of some, some strategies people do that are common in the field. Do these um, QCFC me measures, um, these Z statistics, so essentially the, um, I guess the, how good they are on the stats of various networks. And also the last one, which is the um, I guess improvement or the new technique, is to see how this applies in a task paradigm. Okay, what happened there? I'm not sure what happened there. Okay, so... This is what people do. So you take a, an FC matrix, you look at a particular edge in this FC matrix, and what you see, often quite a lot if you don't have noisy data, if you look at the SC value, and you look at the mean frame-wise displacement, so a measure for motion, you essentially sometimes have this very big correlation. So what people, people tend to do is then count each of these edges and how many of these edges um, have correlations to motion. And you add them all up and just say that's one of your QC measures. If, some of your, if a lot of your edges are correlated to motion, therefore these motion effects really are, are there driving some of these um, functional connectivity values. And this is a problem because if you're comparing two cohorts and you find a difference, you might just be saying, okay, I have the difference between schizophrenia and controls, and all you're seeing is difference in motion, not anything uh, deeper. So you can do this big large com, um, kind of comparison. So uh, someone who's previously in our lab who's now at, at Dan Danny Bessett, uh, Lyndon Parks, he did this big comprehensive, it's a mammoth paper of looking at all these methods. You can see here, uh, Comcore, um, ICA, Aroma, all sort of stuff, and find you know, essentially which one is the best. And 
you kind of use this QC to really judge uh, whether you've denoised your data properly. So other things people do, it will also see as well. If you look at this QC, so the correlation of, um, you know, between two ROIs and the distance, you find that you have an exacerbation of the short range scales and you tend to have this um, motion dependence affecting um, kind of regions of interest that are closer together. So you also kind of look at this uh, property as well. You find GSI reduces this a lot, but also you have this negative deflection, which, which happens as well. Uh, what happened there? Okay, so <laughs> other thing people do is they um, also look at things such as just the statistics of the matrices. As you can see here, I have another big massive study which took a whole bunch of different techniques and looked at the changes of the correlations between ROIs uh, and also the correlation between um, functional connectivity and motion. Um, and essentially, in this paper, of course, they use multi RCA, therefore that one wins on all metrics, uh, which is sort of always seems to happen. And so um, this is a bit of a problem that you, we have a bit of um, essentially a mixed message on what is good, what is bad. Some papers actually purport that fix, RCA fix is very, very good, everything else is bad. Um, other papers say um, RCA Rome is enough. Um, so it's still a bit of a, a mixed message, to be honest. Um, I guess one thing you can take from this is that it depends on your specific data set and how noisy it is. So you can do this comparison within your own data set. Um, so another thing you can do instead, as I said before, is that you can apply this so we have some kind of semblance of a ground truth. Um, so for example, in task fMRI, this pre-processing kind of big fights aren't really done that much because essentially you have this ground truth. If you, if you have a visual stimuli, you should expect to see a response to visual cortex. If you had an emotor cortex, um, that motor stimuli expected motor cortex, that kind of stuff. So you have some kind of ground truth there. So Glasser, uh, Matt Glasser in his temporal ICA paper did exactly this. Just checking the time, how am I going? So one thing he did, he, he did this in all seven tasks of the HCP, and he found that uh, if you look at the Z statistics, of fixed versus minimal pre-processing, you find an increase in the number of, uh, I guess, the statistical significance um, in, your, in your pipelines. And one thing you found as well, when you compare this to something like um, GSR, which is the right one here, is that you essentially have much more, I guess, um, uh, uh, significant um, activations in, um, in task. And you can really say whether or not they are true or not because you have some, I just said some ground truth. An example of how it performs so this is visually. So on the left-hand side, you can see the difference between uh, the minimal pre-processing pipeline and ICA fix. And in this particular motor contrast, um, you essentially have someone, I guess, moving their tongue. Uh, and you have essentially this, this grain area here. And this appears when you apply ICA fix uh, because this, this induces a lot of motions around the sagittal sinuses and it gets rid of it. So it gets the uh, face validity of fix in task data. On the right-hand side, you have this reduction in these carpet plots of these um, widespread signals, but you also have in this particular uh, contrast, you have the activations looking very, very similar, which means you have not removed that much of, uh, I guess, ground truth. Now, I think, I don't know what's going on there, but I think a better metric instead is look at what is removed by a pre-processing pipeline. So I have this thing, uh, I uh, kind of designed this term called the residual spatial correlation. Um, so you're looking at the um, difference of your denoising versus um, what you've denoised from and then comparing that, doing a special correlation of the ground truth. A bit confusing, but I'll show you what I mean. So on this I've got, and Glasifus did this, um, so we've got ICA fix, the, how it looks like, temporal ICA, how the activation looks like in this particular contrast, this is the motor Q contrast. And you, if you minus this from this, you don't have much spatial structure. So you say you're not removing anything that's really correlated to a task. On this left side here, you've got temporal ICA. You also got the comparison of essentially um, uh, GSR. And what you find is that what's removed is essentially um, something that looks like, you know, looks like an activation, looks like real neuronal signal. And if you calculate the spatial correlation, which I've, I've done, they did as well, but then for all, all contrasts, what you find is that temporal ICA, 
you look at the spatial correlation of what's removed versus the ground truth, you find that it's much higher for, uh, um, for GSR compared to temporal ICA, which means that the structure that GSR remove is more correlated um, to, I guess, a ground truth or task. So these are actually really quite in interesting um, findings. Um, I'm going to stop it here at the next pause point because I guess I've got different multiple things. So I'm happy to take questions now as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a good question. Um, I have um, I've been in many I've been in my last previous lab, I should say. Um, we were quite in layer data, and in terms of the denoising techniques, people do very little, <laughs> particularly in in task, um, because you have such low signal that you're really just trying to retain as much as you can. Um, so people don't, don't do much, but you can apply a lot of these things on the surface level. Um, so essentially you can essentially get your volume, um, I guess, volume analysis, get your regress and then just regress out, I guess, the surface level kind of stuff. Um, also the pipelines within HCP, they're all done in gray ordinates, all of them, and they're all done on, I guess, surface and volume. So it's also applicable uh, that way. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of showed this last point about task fMRI, uh, which is where a lot of lay fMRI is at the moment. Um, essentially, um, denoising in, in task isn't as sophisticated, I guess, denoising in REST, because you kind of, you see an activation and you're fine, you're done, you don't care about anything else, you don't have any kind of, no ground truth. So I think it's really picking up though, picking up steam in task. Um, and so yeah. Okay. Uh it's not particularly about you know one particular modality. I'm not working on fMRI, I'm working on structure of MRI. So my question is a general question. When you do peak processing, uh, for example in structural MRI also, when I do peak processing in diffusion and you know MRI data, I go through different, different steps. And then just to make sure I check each and individual subjects, whether it has done the job correctly or not. So my cohort is fairly smaller than you know, 20 subjects which is still possible for me to do it. Uh, you mentioned that you have cohort of 500 or something like that. So how do you make sure if the people saying pipeline has done correct job for each individual subject? I'm asking this is because you know in different disease cohort, uh, in different type of data, uh, this individual check is very important. That might change the final result as well. So how do you make sure that you know, you have, your pipeline has done correct job for individual subjects? And that's a good question. I mean, that's also the beauty of having fMRI prep for this because you can, so each, each report is a web, web page and you look for each subject. You, do, you check each step very thoroughly. Um, to make sure it's worth on each subject, I think that's what you have to do, just make reports. Um, I, in my previous pipelines that I've done before, I've just essentially built, uh, people doing this as well, like in my QC, you're building pipelines just for visualization. Um, so I think you can't really get around, you're right, you can't get around checking each subject. Uh, although it's very, very time consuming, you can have ridiculous er erroneous results. You might have you know, all your subjects being influenced by a high mover or something like that. Um, so I guess for me, it's the reporting that has to be easy to do as well. Um, so if, if you're developing a new pipeline as well, I would say that this is like a key thing you'd have to um, include in your pipeline is easy to, to navigate um, visual reporting. Uh, well, <laughs> that's an ongoing question, I think. For me, for me I guess ad advice-wise, um, uh, um, the next slides I will show you as well. I think, I, I think it's very, very hard to differentiate between physiology and neuronal signals. So if you have these big neuronal signals that are 
very tightly into physiology, um, I would say it's very, very hard to disambiguate. So therefore, I, I would say I wouldn't trust them uh, because they're so heavily corrupted by, it's not just physiology, motion has this very same signature in their fMRI responses. Um, and yeah, that's, that's my take on it. I mean, there is a lot of very potential, interesting stuff. I, don't, I definitely agree with all these things. Um, for me, I think it's still hard to disambiguate so I would rather not try to. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, what we're seeing is the first order physiological compounds are typically uh, compounds evolved, but the derivatives of those physiological signals typically have quite precise and expected effects in the brain. And so maybe it's just a matter of moving that heart rate variability into the beat into more high frequency um, changes in uh, cardiac acceleration, deceleration, the work of Bin Yuan, who you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, the other thing, I mean, and we're going to have to hand over in a minute, but I think it's good to have a few discussions. Is, yeah. um, surely this is moving towards the end of resting state fMRI. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I, there's a big, a bit of a push towards that and heading towards naturalistic stimuli because you have, um, you can, you, you don't have essentially the task-free kind of component, but you at least have something that you can control that everyone's seen the same movie. Um, you do, you do, I guess, expect some kind of change. It's kind of a task, but not that much of a task. Um, I think that's probably the, the way people are going. And that's the way we're kind of going as well. And what are we asking of, of resting state fMRI? What, what are we asking of how the brain functions anyway? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing too, right? I mean, that's the... It's no scientific question. <laughs> between group contrast that we've manufactured contrast by some external ground truth. I'm being very a little yeah. bit provocative here, but... A little bit. <laughs> it does make the question, though. It's going down a little bit of a... Um, it's getting increasingly... Fractionated in different terms, I think. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I've got some more slides, but if I haven't got time, I'm happy to stop there. Uh, it's 4.20, I'm happy to stop. Maybe four minutes. Four minutes, all right, so four minutes, the last clincher of this talk. Okay, so um, I want to now show some, uh, I guess, recent work we've done to add this big gamut of uh, resting state fMRI denoising. Um, so essentially one thing I want to point out is that a lot of people use these uh, copper plots to look at relations between, um, I guess, movement and uh, these time series. But essentially when you do this unfolding into these, from these 4D matrices to do a 2D matrix you see here, what you do, you actually do, this is actually quite random. So MATLAB's reshape versus Python's um, reshape in um, numerical Python, they're different. Uh, and, and other packages have different orderings. And so what makes more sense is that we want to emphasize some of these subjects on a single subject level. So I will show you this particular example. So what you can do instead is you take your time series and I reshuffle it such that I order it by its correlation to global signal. So you see on the right hand side correlation to global signal and on, and on the left hand side you see this, um, this time series. You can see as, as I reshuffle some of these things become more and more apparent. And you can see this particular activity there. You can see its expression a bit more strongly. Another thing you can do instead is to do some hierarchical clustering where I take that same copper plot. It wasn't changed, same copper plot. Um, this is uh, this code by, coded by Ben Fulcher. Um, as you can see here, you have this um, kind of into, into these big clustered camps. And this looks very, very noisy that we didn't think of it before. It didn't look that noisy before. And so what happens is that there's a lot of there's more than meets the eye. Um, the transformer <laughs> reference, by the way, and you can then um, categorize your carpet plots uh, into various components. You can kind of see these sort of typical categories. You don't just see this, you know, global signal. You see kind of these complex, wide-scale deflections. So you have different patterns of the global signal or wide-scale um, deflections. And when I take this GS ordering and also the uh, its cluster ordering, you see these effects get exacerbated. So you can now look at these couple plots in a different eye. And so if you apply GSR, so GSR is normally purported to say, okay, I have this, this global signal, it's correct to motion, I apply GSR and it's flat, I have none of these deflections. I'm, I'm great. If I do a 
ordering due to um, the global signal, what you find is that some of these things get retained. They were gone there, but just by reordering this particular plot, they come up again. If I then do by cluster ordering, you can see here, this is just an illusion of the ordering of the voxels. You still have this large scale, wide scale deflection. And so the issue with that is that these different subjects have different type of expressions. So this very low motion subject on the left hand side, GSR looks like it's removing, making it flat. These subjects here, you have this um, fairly global um, uh, uh, sort of pattern and you don't remove these anti-correlated wide-scale deflections. But on the right-hand side, it's a very, very kind of, very noisy subject. And while GSR looks good if you do a typical carpet plot, if you order this by this cluster ordering, it looks like compared this one to here, nothing's been done. We have this sort of complex biphasic structure. So, by doing this, we went ahead and uh, we decided to have a different method to get rid of these widely diffuse, um, especially diffuse signals um, called DICER. You can see that she's dicing up this bad machine, this uh, carrot. Um, so what we do, we essentially take this correlation matrix, look for these, um, these diffuse um, correlated and uh, weakly correlated structures, and our algorithm using a DB scan, which is like a k-means kind of thing, which is not k-means, but it's another clustering algorithm. We can then take these um, kind of estimates and we can essentially uh, take our data and we can then clean our data using these, uh, these different type of metrics. So I'm going to run that bit quickly. And so we find essentially that it, it does seem to clean up the, the data in terms of its um, uh, this structure quite well. Now, of course, is it too clean? Have we gone too far? So one thing we can just check uh, QCFC matrix, matrices, you know, the correlations to each its the correlation to motion of each edge, and we find that DICER seems to outperform GSR and IC aroma on its own, um, which is quite good. We have this reduction. We also have this very globally correlated structure that looks something a bit more kind of modular. Of course, um, that's all well and good, but if you look at something a bit more sophisticated, such as the um, resting state networks, what you find essentially is that um, you do get a much better sensitivity in these resting state networks. Of course, that's not the best. Uh, what you should look at instead is this residual spatial correlation, which I mentioned earlier that Glasser did. So we did this um, as part of revisions of this paper. <laughs> so reviews, you will see it soon if you're in the audience. Um, we essentially did this on task, and we found essentially that the residual spatial correlation, i.e. what Dyson removes, is not correlated to task that much. It's correlated more to global signal instead. So above this line means it's correlated to global signal, um, correlated to TAS or global signal. Here it means that DICER is more correlated to global signal. So on average, it looks like it's outperforming that. So kind of remaining issues, I just want to say that the noisy strategy is still not agreed upon. It's still a very active area of research. High resolution fMRI is really allowing some data hungry methods, which is um, things such as temporal ICA. Uh, Multi-echo fMRI, I think, has a lot of promise because you can do quite a lot of denoising. Um, and as well as, uh, there's two last things. Temporal ICA is, is kind of a very promising technique if you have the data to do so. Whereas DICER, I think, we're gonna, we kind of say that it's a promising direction if you're looking at lower spectrotemporal resolutions, um, such as in the clinical domain. Um, and I think that'll wrap it up with there. Um, and also thank you for Ben for the, all the gifts in this presentation. Cool, thank you.